All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, Energy Policy Seminar. Um, uh, I'm uh, Henry Lee, um, Director of the Environment and Natural Resources Program at the Belfer Center. Uh, one of the uh, sponsors of this seminar, along with the Mosava Romani uh, Center for Business and Government and the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Uh, this session is being recorded, so if there are people who are unable to attend who would like to see this uh, at a later date, uh, you can simply watch it from the seminar webpage. Um, uh, we also will be taking questions and answers. Uh, well, I uh, know questions, we will try to give the answers. So, um, and uh, that will be at the bottom of the page. So still please type out your questions um, uh, as you have them. Um, and then I will uh, uh, ask them or synthesize them if there are more than one on the same topic. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, Jaichi Alu, who is a postdoctoral research fellow here at the uh, Environment and Natural Resource Program and the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program. Uh, he is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Political Science and the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And prior to his doctoral program, uh, he spent three years uh, working at the Brookings Institute. Um, Daichi, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry. Thank you for, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, so let me share uh, my screen so you can see the slides. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, us china relations and global climate cooperation. So I think uh, for many of us who care deeply about uh, global climate governance, it seems like a lifetime ago since last time, these two uh, largest carbon emitter joined hands to solve the most challenging crisis facing humanity. Nowadays, what we hear about US-China relations is filled with dangerous and sometimes strongly worded confrontations on various uh, serious issue on climate, uh, on economic, political, and security issues. Um, climate change in comparison seems to have taken a back seat. Many voices in both Washington and Beijing insist that um, there is neither necessity nor willingness for the two big powers to engage in serious climate cooperations. Uh, but as many people acknowledge, Climate is indeed a life or death deal for all of humanity. With the world's two largest uh, powers constantly in competition with each other, is climate change really off the table? So my research question for this research is: What does the role? What does climate? cooperation play on US-China relations in the age of global competitions? And what does great power competitions mean for climate change? So the central point that I want to make today, which is also the main argument for my current research is that climate governance can serve as an anchor for cooperation between United States and China to prevent further confrontations. As such, cooperation on global public goods provision is still possible, even if we take a pessimistic view about US-China relations. So when political scientists and political commentators talk about great power competitions, one thing they repeatedly refer to is the Thucydides trap, which is consists of three basic components, a rising power, tend to challenge the existing great powers and the rapid rise of a new power will trigger other great powers to response to balance against it. And during that process, mutual distrust is common between great power due to a commitment problem. And eventually at the end, war is hard to avoid between a rising power and the hegemon. A war can happen neither due to a short-term crisis provoked 
by misjudgment or accidents, or in the long run, the hegemon is inclined to wage a preventive war against the rising power. So scholar, scholars have debates about the strengths and shortcomings of this Thucydides trap, highlighting its potential uh, oversimplification of complex reality. So here today, I'm not going to engage in that debate. The reason I use this framework is because it is the most pessimistic theoretical understanding of great power competitions. If even under this framework, we can find climate change to be a ground for collaborations for the present US and China, then we will expect the role of climate change cooperation only to be more prominent in reality. So as you see this trap, you really emphasize the end which is a war, but in reality, great powers do not clash into war with each other overnight. It takes time for tensions and antagonism to accumulate. Uh, and during this process, a, a rising power will have a strong incentive to de-escalate tension and prevent an immature conflict by reassuring the hegemon as well as to play under the existing order. So, here, um, I construct a formal model to illustrate great power competitions uh, by leveraging this time window. Here, I combine a cooperation game and a preventive war game. So under this uh, cooperation game, defect, defect uh, is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is the neutral equilibrium here. But uh, with the, uh, combine, after combining it with uh, the preventive war game, it might change the, uh, the equilibrium. And here, I'm not going to walk you through all the details about uh, these numbers and uh, equations, but here there are two takeaways from this formal model. First is with the threat of a conflict, the rising power will choose to cooperate instead of defect in the cooperation game, ending in an equilibrium in which cooperation yields the optimal outcome for the hegemon. And the, the rising power must credibly guarantee it won't defect in the future. So uh, how does the reality fit the model? Here, I, in the empirical analysis, I use process tracing and key player interviews. Here is what I found. So uh, in, in, the, in, in the age of great power competition, mutual distrust is common indeed between US and China. For China, China's economic behavior on trade, uh, currency manipulation, and forced technology transfer, intellectual property are, are indeed suspicious. And investment from China is now welcome. Technology and, and their um, difference on technologies and cybersecurity, and there were worries about military and nuclear capacity. For China, the mutual distrust, the distrust is mutual. So China worries about its regime security and territorial integrity. And the US is constantly taking advantage of the existing international institutions. And all the balance move uh, from the US is seen as a containment strategy for China. Let's say the, uh, the TPP and security agreements with China's neighboring country. But as I mentioned before, uh, tensions between great powers do not emerge just overnight. In fact, they were for, uh, in the first turn uh, during the Obama administration, cooperation between US and China is quite common. And there was space for cooperation during that time. First, on, econo uh, on global economic recovery, China and US joined hands on this issue. And the US asked China to, uh, to help him with the uh, nuclear proliferation issue in North Korea and Iran and on other conventional security such as terrorism and, um, and cybersecurity. And lastly, uh, there are corporations on clean energy. But ever since like 2012, there were, uh, the space for cooperation is shrinking, mostly because they, were, uh, they have reached a deep water of negotiations. On trade and intellectual property, like negotiation has stagnated. On nuclear proliferation, while well, Ambassador uh, Tui Tian Kai openly admitted 
in Washington, D.C., on an event in Washington, D.C., actually, uh, openly admitted that China's influence on North Korea was limited. And on cybersecurity, there were constantly debates about like the definition of national security relevant information. The United States won a much stricter uh, uh, definition of national security information, but China wants a much broader, have a much broader definition. And also there were new flashpoints since around 2013, which is South China Sea. Here is the, there is fundamental differences. And uh, as, uh, as seen by the uh, US diplomats, the whole South aggression in South China Sea was a turning point more than anything else. Alarm the US uh, military and foreign policy community about China's true intention and this military bailout. As a result, China has incentive to reassure the United States is willingness to play as, as predicted by the model. So there are three uh, re uh, reassurance strategy played by China. So the first is uh, what the Chinese call it, the new model of great power relations. However, this phrase is merely rhetorical and is unwelcome in the United States because it relies heavily on this idea, a uh, realist idea. And uh, it automatically assumes the United States is the declining power. And the second one is the AIB. So to reassure strategy about uh, US, uh, uh, about China's new uh, intention, China named uh, one of the web, uh, most famous uh, Chinese, Chinese government officials uh, on development who serve as a senior officers in the World Bank, Jin Liqun as the head of the AIB. And Jin Liqun get together a team of US lawyers to draft a, the institutional rules for uh, the AIB. But, it was deemed very suspicious by the State Department. So eventually, US do not want to participate. And the last one, of course, uh, is cooperation on climate change. At the end, climate change does play out and uh, it is binding by international law, the Paris Agreement, and it is the political priority for the United States. Of course, uh, a realistic, a uh, realist interpretation is only one way to read this. There are other great forces that motivate countries to act uh, in international system. For instance, climate change itself should be significant enough to motivate China's action because it is uh, vulnerable to climate change. Also, as part of China's going out strategy, uh, climate activism can help to build up this image as a responsible player. Here, under the logic of realist uh, great power politics, climate cooperation serves the function of a re re reassurance strategy. So does it work? I would say yes. From some um, Chinese diplomats, they were, they were saying there were tremendous interactions between US and China. And this kind of interactions lays the foundation for the success of the Paris Agreement. And from the US side, they see these interactions positive for them to build a personal relationship uh, with, their, with their counterparts in, uh, in China. And this kind of uh, uh, friendly climates uh, move beyond uh, negotiation teams. There were also uh, government, senior government officials involved in from both sides, say uh, the science, uh, Minister of Science and Technology, uh, the Energy Bureau, and the U.S. side has uh, the DOE and the, I, uh, EI, uh, and the EIA um, play. So uh, they call, during this pro their interactions, they, uh, they engage very, in very constructive cooperations, and they think this is positive for U.S.-China relations. And for international observers, they did observe very close uh, interactions between US and China, and there is tremendous trust between these two countries. For instance, at the end, we, we know like at the end of the Paris Agreement, there is a should or shall accidents regarding the wording of the documents. And China uh, gave a uh, want to, uh, was 
uh, was willing to bail, bail the U.S. out on this issue and come try to convince uh, some developing country with the true intention of the United States. So, and obviously, for the for many diplomats uh, in in these negotiations, they want to carry out carry on this friendly climate into uh, other areas, and want this to be set uh, an example for U.S.-China cooperation in the future. But unfortunately, that did not play out. So without meaningful cooperation, we all know all over there uh, during the Trump administration, uh, tensions quickly escalated. And what does that mean for U.S. China uh, for climate then? Uh, on Trump's side, we all know what happens. Like we withdraw, right? But on China's side, China also lowered the priority of climate change as well. So uh, from uh, uh, we can we can observe it. So there were massive coal coal power plant constructions overseas, especially in the uh, in its bill and row initiative, and. China, like in around 2017, 2018, removed some domestic coal power construction restriction that was put in place in, in early 2017 and 2016. And most of uh, another sign is that uh, China transferred the authority of climate governance from the NDRC, uh, the National Development and Reform Committee, uh, to a less powerful administration, uh, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. Uh, who has no previous experience about uh, climate change. Then uh, in 2020, like the global, global pandemic happens. And if we understand this global pandemic in this framework, we can see like global pandemic create a natural shock on the international environment and making the conflict even more likely and more costly for China. So um, China in 2020, China proposed an update of climate pledge of peaking emissions by, by 2030 and a carbon neutrality by 2060, even in the absence of US commitment. While some, uh, as some uh, commentators, political commentators say, well, this move is to make US look back bad and uh, to make the, uh, to make, uh, uh, the, the forthcoming Biden administration look bad, but if, if we understand it uh, under the framework of, a, of the reassurance model, it implies the threat of a conflict is serious enough for China to cooperate, even if the U.S. defects. So today, well, after all this time, uh, mutual distrust and antagonism has rooted much deeper than just four years ago. Now, even if um, the Biden administration come back to, uh, to the climate table and China is willing to cooperate with the US on these issues. Uh, it seems like the bilateral relate, the bad bilateral relations has taken a toll on US-China cooperation on climate change. But there are some good signs, right? So Biden administration reached out, right, to China and Xi uh, Jinping promised to stop uh, building coal power plants overseas. And that is a good, is a good gesture, uh, and it's a good spin for global global met climate mitigation. So, lastly, uh, what's the policy the implication on the future climate cooperation? Then, so, I mean, first, first and foremost, I would say, uh, for all the, for uh, this research, I show cooperation is still possible even if we take a pessimistic view about US-China relations, right? And remember, uh, even during the Cold War, uh, US and the Soviet Union did cooperate on global health issue and successfully eliminate smallpox from the face of the earth. And only if only today, climate change is much more serious issue than just smallpox and it requires much more sustainable uh, cooperation between these two, these, between the two great powers. And only and this time, like solving this climate issue is not just a vaccination. It requires constant cooperation, constant negotiations, and constant exchange of ideas. So this kind of this implies the mutual mutual trust 
between great powers as critical for this glo global climate governance. China must credibly signal its willingness to cooperate with existing international order. And uh, to be honest, climate change, uh, cooperation on climate change alone is not going to cut it. And for the US, there is a delicate balance between strategic competition and confrontation. So managing this level of confronta confrontation and level of competition is very important for the future of climate cooperation. Lastly, um, we saw we want to all want to solve this uh, global crisis, but solving the global crisis requires strong statesmanship from both sides. But currently, we haven't seen that yet. So I am, uh, to be honest, I'm so tired of people talking about uh, politics, talking about climate change is for our future generations. Well, it's not right. Politicians must consider climate change an imminent threat, right? As we can see over the uh, in the, over the last year, uh, hurricanes on the on the uh, on the east coast and wildfires on the west coast and in China, floods and heavy rain, right? That cost real lives here. So, in the future, we must find a way to solve this, and hopefully, this kind of interactions can also help us on the bilateral relations. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, and that was a very interesting talk. Um, let me start with uh, a question that's actually been posed by um, Amanda, uh, which is that uh, when Trump came into office and he backed out of the Paris Agreement, uh, there was the perception that this created a vacuum and that China would step into the vacuum as the world leader on climate, replacing the United States. Uh, that did not seem to happen. Why not? I think uh, for this issue, we need to look back to China's strategy at, uh, at the early Trump administration. So when Trump first came into power, um, I think uh, they were, they were um, saying in China, we in China saying that um, there, although climate is off the table, there is still uh, cooperation on clean energy issue, especially uh, if China buy more uh, um, natural gas from the US, it will help to de-escalate the tensions on to balance out the uh, trade deficits for the United States. And well, uh, indeed at, at, uh, at the beginning, well, based on my personal experience during the time, um, we, it, we, there were uh, the policy community, they talk about this and um, uh, some senior uh, Chinese official they involved in this. But at the end, this was called like, you know, around 2018, because maybe, I don't know, uh, they realized maybe uh, natural gas alone is not going to solve it. So eventually like in 2018, well, climate change is like, too, they tuned it, tuned down a little bit. So if we understand this from the model, uh, say, well, the cost for China to act alone is too high. So they are not willing to do that alone, right? If US defect, we will want to defect. So China was, uh, did not take um, control of this opportunity primarily because to do so would have cost more money than they wanted to pay. Is that mm -hmm. a summary of what you just said? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, this is from John Holdren. Uh, your model specifies that for restraint to succeed, rising power must credibly guarantee that it won't defect in the future. In reality, however, there is no such thing as a credible guarantee about future behavior. Uh, so does that sort of undercut your model? I think it depends on what kind of uh, under what kind of institutional framework there are uh, their cooperations. So at least for U.S. China, uh, for U.S. China cooperation on climate change, there is is in binding institutional rule, the which is the Paris Agreement and the future, whatever the future agreement on climate change. So this kind of reputational cost and 
uh, uh, cost for defecting an international law will be uh, will be uh, a, uh, a credible cost, a credible signaling for China's willing to cooperate in the future. You know, let me go back just for a minute. Uh, first of all, by the way, to everybody, if you've got questions, please put them in the, the question and answer at the bottom of the page and I will uh, relay them. Uh, but if I go back to Amanda's question for a second, uh, we focused a lot in this, you focused a lot on this talk on US-China relations. But there's also China-European relations, China-Indian relations. Uh, can you say a few words about how China looks at Europe? And then uh, we'll go to Lydia afterwards. Uh, sure. I think uh, on this issue, uh, um, as many uh, Chinese diplomats acknowledge, the US-China bilateral relations is the most one of the most important bilateral relations uh, in this multilateral uh, platform. And as Chinese leaders always repeat it, there is no reason for China to uh, have a bad relations with the US. And there is every reason uh, for, for them to, to have a good relations with the US. And on this, on like, on this uh, climate negotiations, China and, the, uh, and, and European counterpart, they, uh, they mostly discuss uh, uh, finance and the carbon market. And for uh, develop, developing country, the break, they want to emphasize um, and highlight the, the rights for carbon emissions, the development rights. And with many uh, least developing country and especially the small island countries, uh, the negotiations focus mostly on South-South uh, cooperations and uh, uh, green finance, as well as uh, adaptation. With the US, it's mostly about uh, transparency, the MRA mechanism and the overall ranking mechanism. How do we guarantee uh, the future for climate change and guarantee everyone have more, uh, uh, everyone will come, will update their, uh, their, their climate pledge and do more. So I think, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I keep, think. Keep uh, going. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, this dynamic really highlights uh, uh, what the Chinese was Chinese diplomats was saying. This interaction with the U.S. is the most important of all. Let me uh, push uh, again uh, on the same theme about relations with other countries. Um, China, for a long time, has been one of the uh, champions of the developing countries. Uh, when we had the group of 77, for example, China took a lead position. And one of the issues was providing assistance, both financial and technical, to the developing world so that it could make the transition to a decarbonized economy. Um, we are now, China is now one of the big economic powers. And uh, the notion that the developed countries should put up a lot of money, I think still has an awful lot of credibility, but should China also be being willing to join and be putting up substantial um, assistance when most of the energy assistance in the Belt and Road has, concession, has basically commercial loans. It does not have concessional loans. The concessional loans are, done, are basically for the transportation infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is a this is a good question. I think um, for most US for for China for China on China's side, I think they do indeed uh, emphasize, do indeed uh, care about like their, their image, especially amongst the least developing countries. And they always say, well, China will be forever a member of the uh, developing community. And on uh, on this on the energy issue, I think China has well in the past has emphasized on the affordable affordability uh, of energy, and that's why this is the justification for for China to build a uh, coal power plants in uh, developing country because it is uh, at least it's cheap for for development now. As some 
well, just a couple of days ago, I read uh, this article from by a Nigeria president saying, well, developing countries need affordable energy first, and then we care about, uh, at the same time, we care about climate change, but the people do need uh, sustainable and uh, carbon friendly and afford mostly affordable uh, energy source. I think here is where uh, US and China can really uh, play, play a big role, especially for the fin uh, for uh, financing these green projects around the world. It's not going to work if like a, a developing country come to US or China say, well, we want uh, uh, affordable powers for development. And then like maybe some uh, diplomat will say, well, let me put you in contact with some think tank uh, or a consultant. We will figure that the cost out. But that's not, that's not what, uh, what they want. That's what, not what the developing country wants. So they want affordable and immediate help for, uh, for, for green finance, for green powers. And they do. Uh, here, I think uh, for most, uh, China, China has the uh, has the cheap tech, uh, manufacturing cost for uh, renewable energy, and U.S. as a responsible power can provide um, find a way to provide uh, the finance they need. And also here is a kind of competition competition to a higher end, right? Who will provide most uh, affordable and sustainable help for the developing country? And there is no room for uh, antagonism here. So China and the US on this front, uh, if they keep this and toxic exchange of words going on, uh, that will hurt their credibility for helping this country. And this toxic bilateral uh, relations hurts the least developing country first because they are the first victim of climate change. Although if I listen to a lot of leaders from the developing world, they would argue that in the energy area, if China really cared about affordability, it would provide them with concessional loans for energy rather than uh, commercial loans. And it would help them uh, develop local uh, the local capacity to produce the same uh, carbon-free technologies within their country. China usually likes you to buy that technology from China, as opposed to assembling in Pakistan, for example, um, a PV uh, plant or a wind plant. Uh, so why, if China cares about affordability, doesn't help create um, the capacity to, to uh, construct local content and provide uh, concessional loans? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is a very good question. I think uh, many, um, uh, some, some of my fellow researchers are doing research on this issue. I'm not experts on China's foreign loan or uh, the Fill and Road Initiative, but uh, I can say a little word, uh, some words about that, like, as my friend told me. Uh, so they were, uh, so, so uh, as for uh, power plants, for coal power plants, China's technology is uh, the state of art is much more, is the most efficient one. So it makes economic sense for this developing country to uh, acquire this technology. And to some extent, this uh, some, uh, as uh, I think Kelly Gallinger find in her research, uh, some like uh, developed country in Southeast and on the Bill and Road Initiative ask uh, the Chinese company to build uh, coal power plants. And for uh, green energy, uh, there, they have to find a way to. Well, uh, these uh, SOEs they have a cal their calculations as well, as well. So it's not simple. Like it's not like SOE is not simply carrying out uh, China's uh, green ambition. It has to calculate. It has a calculation. It has to make sure this uh, power plant actually works. This power plant actually make money. So to balance their uh, to balance their their book, their accounting book. So uh, when there is uh, like uh, in many developing country uh, have low state capacity and low infrastructure uh, capacity, uh, it doesn't make economic sense for this 
uh, uh, for China's SOEs to invest in green energy. And if China like, wants to make this profitable and this SOE wants to make this pro profitable, it requires much more uh, like systematic help from China. It's not just uh, from China and the world. It's not just the, the technology, not, not just the money. So that's why I think here again, uh, China and the US can really cooperate to help developing countries, especially the least developing countries to build up their economic and state capacity. So they can better incorporate this green, um, green technology and green energy. Let me return uh, for a minute to your basic sort of model. Um, there's a question here that says that uh, your model uh, presents primarily uh, this theory of great power bilateral relations. But as we all know, domestic politics also plays a big role in determining countries' relative stances, okay? And for example, portraying the rising power as a threat can be a rallying point for domestic political parties in the incumbent power. How do these dynamics affect the processes related to the trust building and the cooperation that you presented and what can be done to mitigate those negative effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is a, I, 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 I realized this model is oversimplification, but it is a conservative measure, it's a conservative model. So if we can find cooperation grounds, under, even under this very pessimistic model, I guarantee you there were more room for cooperations uh, in the real world. And obviously this positive dynamic interactions, for, in, for instance, interactions between uh, government officials, between scholars, right? They will put a positive spin for US-China relations. And in like, for instance, like there are scholars, scholars can exchange their notes Right, their research notes about the progress and uh, of decarbonization in both countries and in around the world, and how can these countries uh, come together to cooperate uh, to solve climate change? And for U.S. senior senior officials, right, senior officials uh, in the DOE, in the EIA, and China in the uh, uh, Energy Bureau, and on the ME uh, and uh, the NDRC, if there are interactions. At the at the uh, at the lower level, they can carry out this friendly in, uh, cooperative dynamic into their daily work and into their uh, into their administration. To be frankly, now today, China in China, so the uh, the Energy Bureau and the uh, uh, Policy Community on Climate and Energy is the most one of the most like U.S. friendly community in the uh, in, in China right now. And this can be very uh, positive for uh, US-China relations. And we have to, to some extent, expand this kind of interactions to uh, cultivate a friendly relationship that can help eventually uh, mitigate the risk of conflict in the future. Yeah, but there's still a huge incentive if particularly in the United States, for elected officials uh, to use this deteriorating relations with China as a political vehicle to help uh, get uh, more money uh, for their campaigns and more uh, votes for their election. Um, so you can get the high officials who are uh, appointed but it's a lot harder to deal with this uh, in terms of elected officials. I suspect there is a similar group in China that has some of the same incentives. Yes, uh, indeed, that, that's true. That's the, that's the political reality we are facing. Uh, but I think there is a level of priority here. So if that's why I insist we should take seriously about climate change. And if we can solve climate change, like all this promise, all this, and uh, all these elections, that's an, it's not going to matter in the future, right? If we are, so if climate change, if we can solve it, we're all going to kill, be killed by climate change. Neither 
well, if there and if the bilateral relations continue to get worse, maybe maybe we are going to kill one way or another, neither by a nuclear war or killed by the climate change. So eventually, we have to even for the survival of humanity to come up with something, and elected official must face that must take climate change as an imminent threat. It can't long anymore. And this requires, uh, I mean, politicians are short-sighted in, in both countries. And most, uh, and it is important to take a long, long side, a long view about this. And frankly, it is very difficult uh, under the current um, environment, especially in the, the uh, in the converts and in some part of China. So that, to some extent, requires statesmanship. Yeah. Let me again uh, switch gears and turn to trade. Um, if you're going to decarbonize and you're going to move to clean energy, you need a bunch of components that in both countries you don't have within your country, different components in each case. Some of it we trade with each other, but some of it we also trade with other countries. So in that vein, I have a question here, which says, as China is moving uh, to clean energy, the demand for copper is going to increase in China uh, for electrical systems and EVs. To secure the, the import of copper from Africa, China has to secure the South China Seas and build up its Navy. If China takes this short-term benefit as high priority, why do you think climate cooperation is going to end up helping U.S.-Chinese relations. I think this question touched the uh, fundamentals for uh, the future of energy transition. So uh, some of my uh, colleagues are working on this issue of, about the geopolitics of energy transitions. Uh, one insight I learned from them is that for instance, in transportation, they are uh, they are min uh, critical uh, minerals uh, that is critical, like for uh, for uh, EVs and some other technologies. And the U.S. and China have to import it from uh, Africa, uh, South America, and Australia. And in the this is going to so if like at the end by 2050 we eliminate uh, uh, we stop build like by 2030 we stop building uh, uh, um, gas car uh, that run on oil and gas and we are we are uh, in, we are going to significantly increase uh, our uh, wind and solar power that in turn will change the geopolitics of energy as we know it today Middle East is not as Will, will not be as important as, as like South as Africa, as Australia, as South America in the future. And this kind of, uh, this kind of change requires a, a global systematic uh, a tra a trade network and, and uh, supply chain management. And this kind of, this kind of management, uh, requ well, requires, well, neither, uh, if we take the pessimistic view about this, well, China and, and the US will fight each other uh, uh, to uh, secure this resource, right? But uh, on, a, on a positive side, the existing international trade system work well to secure uh, the global supply of fossil fuels, right? And if we can uh, sustain this global, uh, global, global uh, liberal order, liberal economic order, then we can uh, we can make sure uh, we can secure this kind of uh, critical minerals for green power, green development. Well, I might argue that with you because in the case of oil, uh, which was you know mentioned fossil fuels, uh, China uh, had no um, trust in the system to deliver oil to it in a time of crisis and therefore went to countries that the United States did not have great relations with. They went to Sudan, they went to Angola, uh, they went to some other African countries, uh, as opposed to the Middle East, because they thought the Middle East would favor the United States. Uh, if I look at uh, renewables, uh, a major silicone uh, producer in the world is Australia, and China imports a lot of silicone from Australia for its PVs. 
And the United States in, uh, imports a lot of PVs from China for its solar development. If the United States is going to increase its solar development by a factor of three, four, or five, it's going to have to use Chinese um, um, solar PV systems. And China is going to have to import silicone from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, place, from other places. How are you going to do that? The same thing is true of lithium, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uh, one of our colleagues uh, worked. So, and there was, uh, you're going to need a uh, you're going to need a regime that cooperates on trade as well as as opposed to fighting all the time. Yes, that that's very true. And uh, uh, honestly, this current existing like uh, trade relations is not going to sustain if we understand this like uh, uh, this kind of like interdependence. Especially, uh, it will, this kind of interdependence will increase in the future as we prolong uh, in we, as we move on energy transitions. So we eventually they have to find a way to solve it. Well, it's just it's not about like only so. It's so global politics is not about not only about powers. There, are people care, uh, countries care about their interdependence. Countries care about their. Uh, their uh, uh, absolute gain in the system, right? And they care about reputations, care about uh, how other, others see them in the world. So eventually, if they can't deliver, US or China can't deliver this climate, uh, their climate additions, there is going to be very bad for damaging for, uh, for, their, for their international image in, in the world. So even if they want, they want to uphold this thing. U.S. want to uphold its existing order, and China want to be seen as a responsible player. Then eventually, well, they must join hands and deliver deliver this system. Although otherwise, well, I don't see how how it's going to play out. Um, next question: Some decades ago, developed nations transferred several of their energy intensive industries to developing countries. Now they claim that the emerging countries are exporting too much carbon emissions associated with their products. Uh, how do you see the situation? So uh, this, is, this is the about the process of like global economic development. As economic, uh, as a country's economic upgrade, it will tend to like have more uh, service industry and the level uh, and the share of heavy industries is going to decline. It's the nature of uh, development. So, uh, and in this process, like this cap the capital, the uh, manufacturing go to the where I have like cheapest labor, uh, low cost, right? But uh, but at the time we have to not acknowledge that. Uh, Climate climate change was not a serious issue at the time, and uh, as not uh, it, it was not acknowledged as a serious issue at the time, not until like 1990, right, late 1990, and some developed country doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the will to act on uh, climate at the time, and developing country doesn't have the technology, and today, I think uh, the tech technology is here, right, uh, solar, renewables. And we're we're working on uh, uh, nuclear uh, to reduce the cost of nuclear uh, power plants, and we are working on reduce the cost of CC, CCUS. And this with the, all these technologies, with the help of um, this already developed country and some big powers, uh, big economic powers around the world, developing country now is equipped to do that, and. That's why I think developed country must take the uh, responsibility to help to finance this kind of green transition for developing country to not repeat their past of high in carbon intensive development path. Okay, let me uh, again sort of take this another step further is that uh, some people say, well, actually climate change may actually help us economically. And the country that was raised is Russia. And, uh, and basically, as uh, the climate warms, 
Russia now has has the ability to uh, uh, develop the North uh, Pole ship route and basically not really a North Pole, but the Northeast ship route. Uh, and uh, global warming is actually going to benefit Russia and its power position vis-a-vis -vis China and Europe. Uh, what's your response to how climate actually can be weaponized uh, for certain countries and benefits those countries and their power base in the world? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, Russia as the Arctic warm, Russia is going to be, a, again, uh, it's going to uh, increase its uh, global position. But we must acknowledge that if the, uh, if the current trend uh, still like increase like four degree like if there's there's four degree warming most middle east uh, uh, china southeast asia india africa and uh like america uh, it's not habitable anymore so these people these these people are going to move to somewhere else eventually if like at the end, Russia is the only place where uh, people can live, and like maybe Russia and uh, and Canada, people will pour in. So that will change the entire situation. So I, I don't know. That's the that's just how damning that to some extent warn us. How, there is no winner in this climate change issue in, in climate change. Russia eventually have to well. Uh, there was serious uh, 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 immigration issue, and like they have to deal with pressures from China, from Middle East, uh, even India, right? Eventually, because all the people are coming in, and eventually China might uh, uh, might have to compete with Russia to let its people in and and to develop, like say Siberia, right? It's very it's a security risk for Russia as well. Okay. Um, my last question, because we're running out of time, um, uh, was really opposed by John Holder and um, uh, again, which is a lot of what you've been saying makes a lot of sense. And you made a lot of good points. But most of the points you make don't directly relate to your model. How does your model uh, sort of uh, sort of govern our understanding? Or are there other issues that are equally valuable? in understanding the dynamics here? So the model is taking uh, the threat of a of war uh, seriously in uh, in between US and China. So uh, in, my, in my model, like China's move for uh, to engage in global cooperations and compromise on some issues it's a move to de-escalate, to uh, send a friendly signal to de-escalate potential, potential uh, tensions with the US. To that extent, I think uh, this cooperation on, uh, on climate change serves that purpose. And it has, uh, it did find, uh, and China at the end, in the end, the US and China at the end, they did find like a, a, a much, uh, a, a a better bilateral cooperation out, out of this collaboration. But well, as we can see later, what Trump happens, everyone is off the table. But in the future, um, the logic still fly in uh, in this in between US and China. And to, lastly, I think this again, I want to emphasize this is a conservative measure. And this is a uh, very pessimistic assumption. But my point is of as of this study is to point out even we even if we take this very pessimistic view about the future, we can still find room. And climate change still matters. On that note, let me thank you on, uh, on behalf of the audience uh, and behalf of the uh, sponsors of this uh, seminar series. Uh, for a very interesting and uh, provocative talk. And we really appreciate it. And I want to tell everybody that next week uh, we will have Professor David Keith on how to cool the planet, uh, where he is working on a number of issues related to this. And so please join me next Monday. Uh, so 
Thank you all, and I'll see you in a week.